How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. A recent climate summit in San Francisco hosted by Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg showcased the efforts of cities and states supporting the Paris Climate Accord. Joining us today on Climate One are Gloria Walton, environmental justice leader in Los Angeles, investor and climate advocate Tom Steyer, Gina McCarthy, former head of the US EPA under President Obama, climate author and activist Bill McKibben, and Marissa DeBeloy from the Overlook International Foundation. Gloria Walton, let's begin with you. How did you get into climate as an issue area that you were concerned about? For people who don't know about SCOPE, uh, we're a social justice organization known for our community organizing, leadership development, uh, civic and voter engagement work, but we're also known for our job creation initiatives. And so when we thought about the climate sector, we were actually seeing it as an economic opportunity. And in particular, trying to think about how do we create jobs for low-income African-American and Latino families uh, that are poor and working class, like the ones who live in South Central Los Angeles. And at that time, it was billions of dollars that were being invested coming down the pipe. And so we were doing our research. We figured out that the top polluters at that time were our buildings. And if you're familiar with LA infrastructure, we have a pretty old infrastructure. <laughs> and so we saw this as a great opportunity to create good paying unionized jobs. And that was in 2004. Then in 2005 came around and Katrina hit. And what didn't make the headlines was my mother and my family, and all of the families in my mother's neighborhood in Jackson, Mississippi. My mom was devastated, all of the families. Trees fell on homes, schools, there was flooding, and both of those things happened to my mother's home. FEMA came for some, and not for others. I was successfully able to raise a few thousand dollars to support my mom to get this, her roof fixed, uh, to get all of the water removed and for her to be able to get a little bit of furniture. And as kind of months passed, um, and we all pretty much moved on, my family didn't. Gina McCarthy, you believe that poverty is at the root of a lot of what climate is about, but it's not often talked about in the climate conversation. So tell us about you, how you see that connection between poverty and climate. Well, I, I view climate as, as a pollution problem. It is, in my words, carbon pollution is just like every other pollutant. It actually impacts the poor in minority communities more heavily than anyone else. It impacts our kids and our elderly. And a carbon pollution exacerbates those problems. Um, it creates continued inequalities. It keeps poor communities poor. It doesn't allow them economic opportunities. At its heart, carbon pollution is not just the biggest threat that we have to public health and our economy, but it could represent, I think as Gloria indicated, our sort of wake-up call that it isn't just an environmental problem, it's a health problem, it's about families, it's about communities, and it gives us a wonderful opportunity to think about how you address and, and, and drive solutions to climate that actually end up in not just a cleaner and healthier and more sustainable world, but one that's more just. If we miss that opportunity, then we are going to continue to slide back. That's not what democracy is about. That's not what working in public service is about. It's about recognizing all those challenges and finding solutions that meet all of them. And I believe we can. Tom Steyer, is that possible without changing capitalism? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> well, I'm glad he got that question. We want to keep this to 30 seconds. <laughs> Look, I don't think there's any way that this gets solved without the voice of the American people putting bounds and putting restrictions on the way that capitalism works. Because I, I, 
There is a sense that is completely false in the United States that's been around for a few decades that somehow there is a market that is just and efficient and sent down by God and that if we <laughs> monkey with it, that somehow we're gonna be upsetting the natural just order. And that is a fallacy and a myth. Every single market in the world is run according to rules set by human beings. So if, if you take a simple example about the employment market, a hundred years ago, you could have hired someone who was 12 years old to work for you for 14 hours and paid him 25 cents. We, you can't do that today because the American people won't stand for it because we think it's wrong. So when we think about what Gene is talking about, when we think about what Gloria is talking about, which is how we choose to pollute, how we as a society choose to allow a corporation to pollute, that's up to us. And that is a question for people who are thinking about the greater good of the human beings in society mm -hmm. and the justice that's necessary if we're gonna have the kind of society that we want. So it's absolutely incumbent on the government of the United States, and we can see it happening you know, this week in California in terms of what's been passed, that the people who've been elected to represent the will of the people have to represent those people and put the bounds on what's permissible in the market, have to put rules so that people don't, in effect, that low-income communities or communities of color don't become the cesspools and the dumping grounds right. for polluters. And is that changing the nature of capitalism? That's recognizing mm -hmm. the way that the world actually works and that there is an absolute important critical role for government in living up to the values that we share and standing up for the people in society who otherwise would be unfairly picked on. Marissa DeValoy, I want to get you in here and tell us about Dee and Richard Lawrence, and they got into climate by accident going down to Honduras. Yeah, so this is a story that fits in really well with what we've been discussing. So Dee and Richard went down to Honduras about 15 years ago on a medical mission, actually as translators, and they discovered actually Sky Lawrence, their daughter, who I think is in the audience tonight, got invited to some local homes. And she came back saying, Mommy, Daddy, guess what? I've, I've, you know, I've discovered what's going on here. Because you know, the, the, everything they were treating was respiratory illness. Children sucking on nebulizers and you know, mothers just coughing and coughing. And Skye realized why. You know, she was invited to this little home, which is little more than a hut. And the woman inside was cooking on a, what's called a three-stone fire, which is an open fire in a tiny little hut, just breathing in the smoke all day, all day long. And they thought, well, you know, what can we do about this? I mean, it's bad for the climate. It's bad for this family. Isn't there a better way to, to do something about this? And th so they decided to create a, a stove, and they created one that was, you know, you know, adapted to the local community. It wasn't, I make it sound easy, it was not easy. You know, there's a long tradition of uh, Western nonprofits going to other countries and saying, this is how you need to do it, here you go, you know, take this, and nobody ever uses it. So they spent years, actually, working with the local community to come up with a stove that fit the cooking task that was exactly what people wanted, and then they put in a system of coming back time and time again to make sure that people were using the stove, they understood how to use the stove, and they were, you know, continuing to, to get the benefits. And it's, it's, it's transformational, and, you know, this is a, a great example of a, of a carbon uh, pollution reduction project. You know, one of the things that Cool Effect does is we go out and we find these great carbon pollution reduction projects. There are about 10,000 of them out there in the world, and they are not created equal. There's really a, you know, there's a million examples of terrible ones, not so great ones. But on the other end, there are some really fantastic projects uh, you know, many of which are now we've put on the Cool Effect platform that people, you know, like you who are already doing ev absolutely everything they can to fight climate change. And I'm sure everybody in this room is already, you know, voting and advocating and educating and recycling. But, you know, it's a way to do more to verifiably reduce carbon pollution. Tom Steyer, you have an organization active on college campuses around the country, Red States. How do you message and try to connect with people? You're a San Francisco liberal. How do you connect with people in other parts of the country who don't want to talk or you know, think San Francisco liberalism will keep away? Well, our organization is on 421 college campuses this year. And 
we talk to people, young people under 35, about the issues that they're most concerned about, which pretty much across the country involve the cost of higher education, which is a, a, a killer issue that people don't really recognize. Healthcare is a killer issue. Racial justice across the country, people under 35 are very, very concerned with, and climate and the environment. And that's pretty much any place you go. And what I think about American politics today, and this does answer your question, Greg, is that young people vote at, people under 35, which to me is young, um, vote at half the rate of other American citizens. And it's not that they're not informed and passionate and, or are lazy, they have an issue. And the issue is they don't think that the system responds to their needs, and they don't think either party tells the truth. So when, so when someone says to me, how do we talk to students in Iowa in a conservative Christian college, the answer that I have is, first of all, we tell the truth. And we talk to them about the issues frankly and honestly and listen to them to hear what they think about them. When we're talking about energy and climate, we're talking about something that they absolutely know in their bones, has a huge justice element to it. They know that it's an issue that if people are talking about pushing it out and not caring, they know it will affect them. And it's an issue where that entire generation doesn't want to see this swept under the rug. They know that it's one of the issues where the older people in America want to basically pass a gigantic debt onto them, incur a huge debt, and pass it on to their generation and let them deal with it. Bill McKibben, one of the big debates that goes on in environmentalism is trying to bridge individual change and systemic change. And there's quite a debate about people want to say, I want to do an action that matters. Um, so what kind of individual action matters and how can that be connected, you know, rise up to collective systemic change? You know, I think the early days of the climate discussion were a lot about individual action. What am I going to do? What my kind of light bulbs do I have? What am I driving? So on and so forth. And if the physics and chemistry of climate were such that we had 50 or 100 years to deal with the problem, probably a perfectly sound way to go about things. You know, humans and their societies really do change best when they change somewhat slowly and people have a little time to adapt and so on and so forth. But uh, physics is, uh, you know, calling the tune here. And it's very clear that we not only don't have 50 years, we had to start 50 years ago and we didn't. And that means at this point that you can't make the math work one household at a time, one light bulb at a time. Um, that's why so much of the emphasis, I think, in the movement has shifted into standing up to those forces that are keeping us from making progress. We haven't talked about the fact that the climate fight has another side. There is the richest industry on earth, the fossil fuel industry, that's determined to keep things more or less as they are. And it's requiring us to stand up to them. So I guess to go back to your question, the most important thing an individual can do at this point is be a little bit less of an individual, join together with other people in those things that we call movements, the kind of things that Gloria or Tom organize that help compensate for the balance of power that, you know, I mean, look, left to its own devices, Exxon has all the money in the world. They have, I'm, a, I'm only a Methodist Sunday school teacher, but it's my firm belief they have more money than God. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and so left to their own devices, they'll happily go on wrecking the planet while the rest of us happily go on changing our light bulbs. Tom Steyer? I, I think what Bill is saying is obviously true, that what we have is a political problem and that the solution to our problem, we have a corporate takeover of our democracy, and the only thing we can do to take back our democracy is be organized and use our votes. And unless we are organized, unless people understand what's at stake, and unless people show up at the polls and assert our 
200-year-old democracy and insist that it's by, of, and for the people. Our votes, then these, our votes and everything else. The, yes, That's I agree with you, Bill. It's not just voting day, but divesting it's... our money. It's why we have to be sitting down in front of pipelines. It's why we have to be doing... But on an even... On the autumn of an even-numbered year, you're absolutely right. Votes are uh, and, key. But what I'd say is this. What Bill is saying is don't expect that the logic of your argument, that the justice of your argument, that the irrefutability of your argument is going to win the day. Because I believe that the people on this stage have a laid-down argument on any one of those factors in terms of justice, in terms of prosperity and job growth, in terms of health mm -hmm. of Americans, in terms of America's moral leadership in the world. It's an absolute lay down. The question is, that's not getting it done. There are interests on the other side who don't even argue back because they can't. But what they're doing is they're preserving their bottom line at the expense of everyone else in society. And what we need to do is assert our collective will, the will of the American people, to protect ourselves and stand up for our values through our democracy, or we'll pay a gigantic price for their selfishness. Yeah. We, yeah. we have a question from Twitter from Ann Hancock. Uh, we'll put this to Gina McCarthy. What do you recommend climate movement leaders do to help the movement become more effective and powerful? You've been inside government at the highest levels. Answer that question. Well, I think right now to not focus so much on what's happening at the federal government because yeah. it's nothing. Um, and to, and to uh, you know, I suggest that people turn off their televisions and look at the real world. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have to say that what Tom is doing to actually go out to young people and, and get them engaged again is probably the most important thing that we can do right now. You know, I'm at Harvard practice at Harvard, um, <laughs> because the students care more about social justice than you can ever imagine. One of the most popular courses at, at the B School, which is the Harvard <laughs> Business School, is called Reimagining Capitalism, mm. because it's not working. <laughs> you know, it's not working for everybody, and, and honestly, it, it distresses me that, that when Tom talks about the fact that, you know, students aren't voting because government's not working for them, who do they think government is? We happen to be an of, by, and for the people government. And if they don't vote, then stop talking to me about what you don't like. That's it. So, you know, and, and so, I, 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 you know, right now I think a lot of what government does doesn't work because it's been specifically targeted to make it not work by people who don't want government to work because they have all the power. So we have to kind of grow up here and, and recognize that we, we have all the best arguments, but frankly, the people we're fighting against don't even have to argue at all. They own it. Right. So we have to get to the students and remind them that we, this country has been through some very difficult times. I think that this is an extraordinary moment when we either save our democracy or we don't. And so they have to step up. We all have to step up and we have to stop arguing with one another and we just have to vote, we have to act, we have to forget about the things we can't change and we don't like and we have to make it the world we want. I have some true or false questions for our guests, uh, beginning with uh, Tom Steyer. True or false, you made a lot of money off Canadian tar sands and Indonesian forests. I will say this. I know we made money off fossil fuels, and I don't specifically remember some of that, but we invested in every part of the economy. And starting in... 2008, I came to the conclusion it was wrong, and so I've been divested for years, and I decided, in fact, we can't afford to have those kinds of activities, and so I don't. A little longer than true or false. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I don't like this game. Yeah. <laughs> don't say. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you, do you is it a truth or dare? I mean, do we have to do yeah. something really bad? Gina McCarthy, oh, true, shoot, true or false? 
<laughs> yes. You are having difficulty figuring out how academia works. Yes, true. <laughs> See? True. That, oh, thank God that was easy. <laughs> Maybe this, uh, also for Gina McCarthy, true or false, you are personally sick and tired of hearing about polar bears. Yes, true. <laughs> I love them, they're cute, but they're not my grandson. Uh, true or false, Gloria Walton, you sometimes don't talk about climate concerns because you think people don't want to hear the doom and gloom. False. <laughs> I mean, y'all feel me. It's like I talk about what's real and what needs to be said in any yeah, given moment. Bill McKibben, true or false, villainization could be the downfall of the climate movement. Villainization? Meaning? Villainizing black hats, you know, oil companies or... Oh, yeah. I think uh, just the opposite. Uh, <laughs> the, the moment that people started to... The moment that people started to understand that there was some... Um, uh, 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 someone that needed fighting was the moment that it turned serious and got real. That's why, you know, people, I mean, look at our, um, look at the people who were out in the street last week in San Francisco. The first four uh, blocks of that march were all indigenous people, mostly from North America, but from around the world. Yes. You don't think, you don't think they get that there's like a villain in, the, I mean, you know, I mean, exactly how much American history do you need to kind of <laughs> figure that out, you know? Um, um, so, and, and I think and, Bill's equivocating here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let, me ask, let me ask Marissa de Beloy, uh, true or false, carbon offsets inhabit a shady and murky world. That is true, and that's exactly why Cool Effect was created. Uh, Gina McCarthy, true or false, President Obama could have got a carbon price through Congress in 2009 if David Axelrod and Rahm Emanuel had encouraged him to try harder. Mm, that's a very good question. I don't think so. Also for Gina, because uh, right. <laughs> you like this so much, uh, true or false, Coal state Democrats blocked the Clinton-Gore administration from putting a price on carbon in 1994 in the form of a BTU tax. I believe that's true. West Virginia. Um, Tom Steyer, true or false, corporations wield way too much influence over our democracy. No question about it. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> That's a, base, that's a basic fact of American uh -huh. democracy and politics. Well, they are people, you know, right? <laughs> uh, they pay a much lower tax rate than people, I'd like yeah. to point out. <laughs> Which you, you, you favor changing the, the carried interest rule, right? Absolutely. Last one, uh, true or false, Bill McKibben. Tom Steyer is running for office. He just can't decide which one. <laughs> Why, why are you asking me? <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I thought he might have told you. Because <laughs> I know if we ask him, we're not sure. That we get. Let's give them a round for getting to the light. <laughs> <laughs> we're all friends. Right? Good work. Yeah, so good. You're great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good work, uh, friend. Question from Facebook, uh, Don Hall. Can you please oh, speak no. to your vision of the world we want in addition to what we don't? What would a truly post-carbon, just sustainable and resilient society look like? Gloria Walton, what's it look like? Paint us a picture. Wow. It looks like a place where all of us actually have a good paying job breathe clean air, a new, clean, sustainable economy where we have 100% renewables for 100% of the people. Thank you, Solutions Project. It looks like a place where we actually do have inside, outside strategy and an authentic democracy where all voices are heard um, and we lead with race and equity front and center so that we actually can have an equitable, sustainable economy that works for all people. Bill McKibben, tell us about, you've been involved in a divest, invest, and it's gone from a small amount of money to a huge amount of money pretty quickly. Tell us the scope and, and regionally where divestment is happening. Uh, the divestment thing has been a 
remarkable ride, one that we didn't quite expect when we started it five or six years ago, um, it, sort of spurred on by memories of the, the fight against apartheid. Um, and in fact, it was Desmond Tutu was one of the early people saying, do this, do take this tool again. It's now much larger than that. I think yesterday uh, there was a press conference where the, the total was $6.24 trillion uh, in endowments and portfolios that have now divested in part or in whole. And what began with small colleges in you know the corners of this country, it's now New York City, it's now London. Uh, New York City, the mayors of New York and London yesterday challenged all the other mayors in the world to divest their pension funds. The country of Ireland, the whole country of Ireland, divested its holdings in fossil fuels last month. Money is the oxygen on which the fire that is global warming burns. And if we are able to stamp out that supply of money, then that fire will begin to dwindle. And divestment is a huge part of that. And it's extremely exciting to see. It. And, and just to get back, I mean, Harvard may be the last place on earth to divest. I don't know. I'm really glad that Gina's going to be giving it the college try. I want to I call out uh, uh, for, for Tom's wife. Cat Taylor, who was on the Harvard, I believe, on the Harvard board of whatever it's called, Overseers, Overseers which is a tells you something right th there. <laughs> um, uh, hey, uh, I just started there. Give me a break. Cat, yeah. Cat Taylor, yeah. Cat Taylor resigned in protest from the Harvard board of Overseers because they wouldn't divest. Let's hope that. I mean, look, if there's a if there's a rationale, if there's any reason at all to have establishments, you know, in Harvard is a great example of an establishment. Uh, it's that in moments of crisis, they might actually provide some leadership um, that Harvard hasn't, but it could. And so could a lot of other places. And that would be great. We have to Amen. end it there. We've been talking about healing the climate and moving to clean energy at Climate One. Today, we're launching our Let's Talk campaign. All of our guests up on stage made a video back uh, in the green room. You have signs on your seat, and I encourage you to make your own. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. You can join the conversation using our Twitter handle at Climate One. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. Mm -hmm.